Karib will speak today about management of acute stroke 2021. Also, it's my pleasure to be with uh, Dr. Ashreen Faraj. She's a neurology consultant and head of neurology department at Cairo, Surgeon Mahmoud at Cairo. And Dr. Majid Bakhit, he's a consultant, a stroke neurologist, and a neural rehabilitation at Saudi Journal Hospital Jeddah. And Dr. Ahmad Al Ghadi, he's a neurology specialist at Saudi Journal Hospital Jeddah. Uh, please, Professor uh, uh, Shaibu, are ready to hear from you. So, um, thank you. Uh, and Salaamu Alaikum. It's my pleasure. And just before we started the program, I was talking with Dr. Mustafa that. I would much rather prefer being in Jeddah right now instead of Canada because I could have easily finished this presentation and then gone on to uh, Makkah to do my Umrah. And there's nothing more beautiful than doing an Umrah at night when things are not that busy also. But maybe, inshallah, another time. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, that's my, <laughs> my watch talking to me. So uh, in my disclosures, I have no conflicts for this presentation. This is what I intend talking about. I want to talk about safety and importance of making sure that your patients do not get into any complications. This is most important for the nurses, especially those who are part of the stroke unit. I will talk about speed and I'll give you evidence why speed is so important with safety, of course. Then I'll talk about imaging and how imaging makes it so um, easy for us to figure out which patients would benefit from treatment at what time. So some are fast progressors and I'll show you why in such patients you've got to go out there and treat them as soon as possible because you'd lose that window if you waited too long. And then other fortunate people with good collaterals you can treat them hours or even days after their acute stroke. And, and imaging is what helps us define these patients. Finally, I want to give you examples of three common scenarios, very common scenarios, where sometimes we hesitate to give treatment. And these are patients with very mild symptoms, which unfortunately is half your patients that come in within the, the, the window for treatment. I'll talk about patients with very severe symptoms, where you're scared that you may cause a bleed and, uh, and patients who come in outside of the window, not just with thrombectomy, but with thrombolysis also. So let me begin, and I'll finish this in 40 minutes. So first of all, what is really important, when, when you see a patient who comes to your emergency department, whether you're a nurse or an ER doctor, or if you are um, a physician routinely dealing with these patients, you have the following thing in mind. Your primary goal is to slow down the injury. And once you've done that, you want to figure out what the diagnosis is and then offer preventative therapies because the second stroke is always worse than the first one. Most people will recover to some degree from their first stroke, but if they happen to have a second stroke, then things are too late. Today I've been given 40 minutes, so I'm going to focus on only the top three strategies. So when, when the patient comes in, they're unstable. So what we do is we want to make sure that you prevent complications. The emergency department is the worst possible place for a stroke patient. As soon as you are called in as a, a, a neurologist or, or a stroke, anyone who's taking care of the stroke patient, and you think it's an acute stroke. So if you think it's an acute stroke, you first want to make sure that you rule out the mimics, which as, as most of you know, um, about 30-40% of patients who come in where you are asked to see the patient, they turn out not to have a stroke. They could have migraine auras or seizures or maybe in delirium. There are multiple causes for that. So you confirm your diagnosis and, and then you make a decision very quickly whether they're candidates for TPA or not. So that's where my focus is today. I would not be talking about etiology and I won't be talking about recurrences and how to prevent them. So these three things are the important things. When you're in the ER, you have to act very fast. Everything has to be done very quickly. 
So your examination, what we teach, and I've done this for 25 years now, uh, you, you go to finish your exam, you've got to finish your exam in five minutes to six minutes. That's all you get. And, and most of the times it is as the patient is coming into the emergency. And I hope that with your hospital, you know, the busy hospital, you have a CT scanner in the emergency room. The time you get is between the triage and the CT scanner getting ready for you. What you want to make sure is the time of onset. That's the most important thing that you cannot forget. It's sometimes very difficult if the patient is alone. Um, you want to make sure it's a, it's a hemiplegia. Is it, is it anterior circulation or the posterior circulation? And if you think the symptoms are within the previous four hours, then you don't need anything fancy. All you need is this arrangement. This is our emergency department. This is uh, our patient in the scanner. We've got the IV TPA ready. We, we treat about 180 patients a year with IV TPA and close to 180, 190 with thrombectomy. So let's talk about IV TPA. We keep our door to needle times and we want to keep this under 40 to 50 minutes because the faster you treat, the better it is. So you do your plain CT scan, you look at the uh, area around the basal ganglion and, and, and higher, uh, and, and, and you can the supraganglionic, and you want to make sure that you can quantify if the scan looks good. In a patient who is under four hours and where you want to give TPA, this is all you need. Make sure it's not a bleed, right? And make sure it's not a large stroke. And then you go ahead and start treating them in the, in the emergency department. And the reason that the reason it's so important to treat early is the following: is the risk of a hemorrhage. The longer you wait, the higher your risk of a hemorrhage. And as I'll show you, your return on investment decreases also. In other words, if you wait too long, then the TPA does not work very well. And I'll explain that to you in a few slides down. So when we look at the risk of hemorrhage, we talk about hemorrhagic infarction out here, see, tiny bit of hemorrhage, petechial hemorrhage. This is type one. If there's more confluent bleed inside that infarct, it is hemorrhage type two. And when you start seeing some degree of swelling around it, and, and, and it becomes a much larger confluent hyperdensity, that's type one hematoma. These three in general are okay. It's not a big deal. You'll see some of this whenever you give TPA. It's a type two hematoma, the large one which displaces the, the ventricle or certainly bigger than the infarct itself that causes problem. How, how common are symptomatic bleeds? It depends again on the time. In the initial 90 minutes, hematomas are uncommon and at least a quarter of the patients you treat make a good recovery. As time goes by from the 90 minutes to three hours, you can see you, you, you've increased your risk of bleed and you've lost some um, efficacy of the treatment. Uh, if you go up to four and a half hours, now you can see that you have more than double the risk of a bleed and your gain has also gone down. Beyond that, beyond that, there's no point in treating these patients because your risk of hemorrhage is much more than the treatment uh, gain that you may get with TPA. So this is in general. So up to four and a half hours, all you need is plain CT scan for is to rule out a bleed and treat these patients. The faster you treat, the sooner you treat, the better this gain, right? Now, why don't we treat these patients? There's a whole list. It's a very big daunting list of contraindications and they can be broken down into the following categories. Some of them are real and many of them are perceived. So people are scared if the person is too old. I'll tell you, don't worry about that. People are scared about a severe stroke. I'll tell you again, don't worry about it because the outcome without TPA is worse than with TPA. I'll talk about duration and wake up later on today. We are worried about seizures at onset, hyperglycemia, high blood pressure, we can manage these. We can manage their hypoglycemia, 
we can manage their blood pressure, don't worry about disabilities, mimics are very common. And so you've got to make sure that if it's a hypoglycemic hemiplegia, that you treat the hypoglycemia in those patients. This is a term that you may not be familiar with. It's called recrudescence. You may not be familiar with the term, but you see it quite frequently. It is a patient who's had a stroke, which was a year ago or five years ago, but then they have some acute illness. It could be a bladder infection, or it could be a metabolic dysfunction. And the symptoms that they have from their original stroke come back again. So it's not a new stroke, but it's a reappearance of symptoms of their old previous old, old, old stroke, right? And, and, and if you're suspicious, the only way you can find out whether it's a new stroke or symptoms of an old stroke is to do an MRI in these patients. The second group of uh, conditions that you have to worry about is trauma. If the trauma is remote, don't worry about it. If the tumor is hemorrhagic, or you think the symptoms are because of the tumor, then you don't need to treat it. But if it's a meningioma that's incidental, you don't have to worry about it. Similarly, aneurysms, you, you, as the more CT angios you do, the more aneurysm you'll find. And if they haven't bled, I don't think you should worry about it. The cardiac condition that you've got to be careful about and we see that once or twice a year, is um, bacterial endocarditis. In those patients, you're, you've got to be very cautious. What about a previous hemorrhage? If the hemorrhage was remote, don't worry about it. If there is a history of subarachnoid hemorrhage and it's remote and the aneurysm was clipped, you've got nothing to worry about. You will see arterial dissections. If they're in the neck vessels, don't worry about it. If it's in the aorta and, and you see them uh, once in a while, that's where you do not give um, a TPA because you'll likely kill the patient. Anticoagulations and antiplatelets and low platelets, um, these are um, something I'll just talk about in a second. And if they've got active bleeding, you've got to be cautious. Uh, what about recent surgery? If the surgery is major surgery, uh, be careful. But if it was superficial surgery where you can put, put pressure, you, you, you're okay. I, I, we usually don't worry about arterial puncture. We do worry in our patients about recent drug use. So the real ones that we worry about in summary are the following. Recent large acute stroke or recent ICH intracranial hemorrhage, major surgery, especially if it's in intra-abdominal uh, or intra-thoracic or intra intracranial surgery where you don't have access. Uh, if there is therapeutic anticoagulation, and, and that's common, or there's very low platelets, so the platelets are less than 50,000. If there's recent major trauma, or if there's been uh, a history of drug abuse, and you think the stroke may be related to amphetamine or cocaine, right? So that's my basic background information. Th this was my first part of the presentation. Uh, next, I want to talk about speed. All right, so speed is what we like a lot. And I, just before the presentation, I was talking to Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Ahmed that in Alberta, where, where, where I work, we um, are, are big on speed. Speed means from the time of onset to the time you're notified, that's when you start working towards treatment. And, and what we do, and there's about a, a two dozen other centers in the world, is have one of these ambulances. These special, that's me incidentally. Uh, this is the side of a road. Um, and we, go, we get in there and we do a scan in the ambulance itself. Now, most of the time we can give the IV TPA within an hour or less. And I'll tell you what difference that makes. So in the next four slides, I'm going to show you the impact of time on success with thrombolysis. And part of it is that as time goes by, literally every hour that goes by, that clot, that embolus to the brain hardens and it makes it more difficult for the TPA to work. So I have a big, big audience here and some of them I'm told are not very familiar with, um, with um, a thrombolysis. I'm almost scared you've got 950 people I don't know if this is real or just, uh, you guys are just making it up. There's a pretty large group. 
uh, so speed, right? So I'm going to show you faster is better. And uh, uh, what does the mobile stroke unit do? Um, so here's uh, the big deal. So years ago, when the first study, and we were part of this, this is how old I am. This is 94, when the study was completed with IVTPA, it's called the NINS trial. So if you were to be asked, if somebody had a stroke and you did nothing, you just observed them, you took 100 patients. Out of those 100 patients, at 90 days, 26% of them would make a full recovery. So they can run around and do whatever they want to do if you did nothing. So this is the uh, observed natural history. If you treated these patients within four and a half hours, which is our standard of care, you would see this. You would see an additional six people. So out of 100 people who got TPA within four and a half hours, an additional six people would make a full recovery. But look at how this changes if you treat them within 90 minutes. Look at that. So that number goes from 26 now to 48. So if you do the math, there is now 22 additional people whom you've been able to treat who made a full recovery, right? Now, in the ambulance setting, this is very new. This is data that was uh, presented, hasn't been published yet, in uh, two months ago at the International Stroke Conference, that if you bring this one and a half hour, if you bring that to one hour, bring it to one hour, this is what happens. So now, now you've gone to, uh, instead of 48%, uh, um, literally two thirds of your patients, 68% of your patients, now would make a full recovery. So speed is so important. And that's why I was teasing uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa is that you guys should buy a stroke ambulance in, uh, in Jeddah uh, for multiple reasons. But anyhow, so my second part of my presentation was treat early, but treat safely and move these patients to a stroke um, unit. And I, and I know that you have good stroke units uh, because that's where you prevent complication. So um, that's the second part of my presentation. What about imaging? I've been talking about imaging and imaging to me is very, very important. I come from a time, I started my training in 1982. That's how long ago it was. Our first CT scanner came at that time. And I can tell you that it wasn't a very pretty thing to look at. Uh, you could identify big tumors and bleeds, but not anything simpler. So, so our rule of thumb is the following. And again, I'm gonna make it a little simple because um, we have over a thousand participants. I don't know what's going on here. Um, so th this, this is our rule of thumb. If you're treating somebody with TPA under four and a half hours, a plain CT scan is all you need. And this is important because in our practice, when somebody comes into the emergency, you spend seven, eight minutes, you've given them um, your, your examination, they go straight into the CT scanner, there's no bleed, there's no big stroke, start TPA. Once you've done that, and if you consider this patient to be a candidate for thrombectomy, if it's less than three hours from onset, then all you need is a CT angio before you take them for EVT. Again, the sooner the better, our EVT, so the, the door to grind time, so the time it takes for the patient first coming to the emergency to the interventionalist putting the needle in their grind has to be one hour. You have to work very, very fast. And there are multiple reasons for that because earlier on, you cannot differentiate between slow progressors and fast progressors very well. If on the other hand, you're going to treat this patient beyond the four and a half hours, then CT perfusion or MR perfusions become very important. On CTA, the goal is to find out how good their collaterals are, which is somewhat difficult to do. And I'll explain to you in the next few slides. CT perfusion makes it a little easier to do that. And I'll encourage you to look at some of these softwares that make it a little easier for you. So first, what do we do in our center, right? So I showed you this part. 
So your, your CT scan looks good. There's a little bit of uh, uh, changes in the very um, sylvian region in its insular cortex. The CTA shows an occlusion in the MCA and the source is probably uh, stenosis of the internal carotid artery. On table time is 10 minutes. We call the interventionalist and this patient goes straight to uh, the angio suite. If it's under four and a half hours, if it's more than four and a half hours, then we'll do CT perfusion in these patients. What does the CT perfusion do to help us? So uh, first of all, look at your collaterals on the CTA. So if it's under four and a half hours, if it's up to here, then you look at your CT perfusion uh, on, on, on CT angio. So in this patient, there's an occlusion of the MCA. You can see this is a poor collateral. This patient is not going to do well. You can see there's almost no blood vessels. There's no collaterals at all in this patient. Compare this patient to somebody with moderate collateral. So here's an occlusion. You can see some vessels, see that? Some cortical vessels, um, but not as good as this patient with excellent collaterals. These vessels are quite robust. Now, if you look at this, so th this uh, poor collaterals are about 15% of your patients, moderate collaterals are about 30 to 40% of your patients, and the remainder, 30% or so, are excellent collaterals. So if you did nothing, so you had three, these three occlusions, and you did an MRI the next day without any intervention, this is what you see. Bad collaterals, huge infarct, moderate collaterals, moderate size infarct, and excellent collaterals, a very small infarct, even though you did not intervene. So that's why imaging becomes so important. Secondly, if you look at beyond four and a half hours, this is where um, these softwares become very important. We used to use MyStar, the Siemens has its own software, and the other two, the one that's used all over the world is called RAPID, and I'm going to show you images of RAPID as we go along. So firstly, the core is the purple, the penumbra is the green. So the bigger the difference between the core and the penumbra, irrespective of time, if you saw this at three days, this patient would still be a candidate for thrombectomy. So time is relevant in the first Four and a half hours beyond that, imaging takes every imaging becomes everything. My cell phone and my watch both have uh, uh, the the rapid software installed in it. And anytime there's a patient who gets a stroke and gets a treatment or, or gets the imaging, I, I I can see it wherever I am. Here's an example: somebody who came into the hospital 14 hours. Remember, tiny little stroke that's developed massive penumbra in here. This patient gets an angiogram 14, 16 hours later, there's an occlusion in the proximal M1, which is treated with the first pass, the vessel opens up and look at the imaging. The patient makes a full recovery, 72 hours later, there is no stroke at all. These patients would do well. So these are slow progressives. On the other hand, unfortunately, there are patients who are fast progressives where the imaging can help you also. Here's a patient we had enrolled into the escape trial who presented at one hour and 50 minutes. So this is a plain CT scan. On CT, uh, CT angio, you can see that all this area has almost no vessels at all with an M1 occlusion and the CT perfusion shows that most of that hemisphere is gone. Because this patient had presented very early at one hour and 50 minutes, we proceeded to do a CT um, um, angio, uh, and, 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 and I'm sorry, we proceeded with the conventional angio and this patient got a stent put in. Um, and you can see that despite very early treatment within two hours and 40 minutes, is a big hemorrhagic infarct. So again, I want to emphasize imaging is really, really important for you. Now I'm going to give you two examples of what we are now doing quite frequently, which is you do a CT in the angio, uh, in, in the ambulance, and you don't wait to stop in the CT for CT angio or CT perfusion. You take them direct to the cath lab. This patient I saw personally uh, about three months ago who was exercising 
and uh, had a sudden onset of large uh, of aphasia, hemiplegia, and and, and uh, weakness with an, with, with an NIHS score of 1718. Is this is the CT scan in the ambulance? There's a large clot sitting in the proximal middle cerebral artery, and you can see that the rest of the brain looks very good. We gave him IVTPA in the ambulance, literally 45, 50 minutes into the onset of his stroke, brought him to the hospital, did the angiogram. You can see there's a large proximal M1 occlusion. This patient got a trivial stent put in, and within minutes, he had opened up the vessel. And two days later, you can see he makes a full recovery, and his MRI shows a very small scattered infarct, and basically he was discharged from hospital within three days. What's also very, very interesting is my second patient. I saw this patient last week, 61 year old. He gets the CT scan within 44 minutes and we give him TNK. We are doing this prospective trial where we are comparing TPA to uh, TNK. So this patient gets TNK in the ambulance, is brought in to the uh, angio suite because we didn't, did not stop for a CT um, in the hospital. Here's an occlusion. And as we are watching him, and all he has is TNK, the next image you can see the vessels open somewhat and without any intervention. It opens, opens up completely. Um, and during this time, he must have been a fast progressor. All he's left it is the next day is it with, with, with a stroke and mostly with his broca's area. So, so he was walking around but couldn't speak uh, and he's still in hospital right now. So early treatment uh, with uh, thrombolysis is very effective and you may even prevent thrombectomy in these patients. So that was my background of um, speed and imaging. I'm gonna end my next 10 minutes or so with uh, these three scenarios that are very, very common. So firstly, too mild. How common is that? And we see them every week. So here's a, a 78 year old who presents within an hour, an hour and a half with very mild right arm weakness and some word finding difficulties. He has a history of diabetes and hypertension um, and coronary artery disease. He's also on metformin at our most appropriate medication. His NIHS is five. His imaging um, shows minimal effacement in the uh, periventricular area on the left side, uh, I beg your pardon, on, on, on the right side. And uh, his uh, uh, CT, um, CTA shows his, his MCA occlusion in there. Um, and we do a CT, uh, uh, CT perfusion on, the, on this patient. And the CT perfusion shows uh, the area where the speech, probably his, uh, his um, vertex his area is, but there's no infarct at all. So nine mils of tissue at risk, uh, are, and, and I think uh, this patient gets IV TPA, and the next day you can see he had a subcortical small stroke. It's difficult. I mean, these are the kind of patients where uh, if you have three stroke neurologists, you know, one would say, oh, I, sh I always treat, and somebody else would say, I never treat. And then of course, there are people like me, I, I would go on the imaging. So we do advanced imaging. If I see an arterial occlusion, and if I see a mismatch, I will treat these patients. But if I don't see them and it's a subcortical mild stroke, I'll probably not give them TPA. How often does this happen? This is a very recent paper from the US, just published last year looking at uh, a year and a half experience. So during, this is a sample of the entire US, uh, during a year and a half, they recorded um, 100, almost 180,000 patients. And you can see that the vast majority had mild symptoms. So 58% of them had mild symptoms. How often was their treatment offered to these patients? About less than half of these patients got IV TPA and about 10% got thrombectomy. So patients who were younger, patients who had more severe deficits were more likely to be treated. This data is from the US, and this is data from Qatar. When I was there, we were setting up a stroke program there. So we looked at 6,300 patients, 
um, this we published, I think a year and a half ago now. Um, and of these patients, there were a thousand, see in here, a thousand patients presented under four hours and very similar to the US data, about 60% of them presented with a mild stroke and IHSS of less than five or equal to five. And half of these patients roughly, um, I shouldn't say half, um, a two third of them, 381 did not get TPA and about 125 got TPA. What was the most common reason for not getting TPA? In the experience in Qatar, it was too low in NIH SS or if the symptoms are improving. What happens though? They, they may be improving, but they suddenly start progressing and then you're outside of the window and it becomes very difficult for you. So if somebody has mild symptoms, but they start progressing, that's a group of patients that you've got to be very careful about and you need to worry about these patients. There's data there also. This is, this is French data published last year in approximately 730 patients. In this cohort, um, about 100 and, um, and so, so the majority, no, I'm sorry, uh, of these uh, patients, uh, who were mostly um, middle, middle age, um, there were 88 patients who progressed. So they started off with mild symptoms, minor stroke, and there were 88 patients or 12% who progressed. If they progress, then their outcome is really bad, even though you do a thrombectomy. So what I'm trying to say is that if somebody comes in with mild symptoms, this, these are the patients where you do imaging. If they've got an arterial occlusion or if they've got a mismatch, then you're going to be much more aggressive with them. At the very least, treat them with IV TPA. And in our practice, if they've got a proximal occlusion, we almost always treat them. The second common scenario is too severe a symptom. Here's a 60 year old, comes in within 90 minutes, and has hemiplegia, aphasia, is hypertensive, has atrial fibrillation that he not, that was not previously known, and a very large stroke. So um, NIHSS of 24. This patient's uh, scan is right here, looks very good because he'd come in early. And here's his, uh, um, his uh, 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 rapid, which shows a very large area of penumbra, tiny bit, of uh, uh, a stroke, he gets uh, an angio, and after his first pass, the vessel opens up. Two days later, despite the very large stroke, small infarct, and he makes a full recovery. So these patients, although um, they may have severe deficits, the IV TPA may not work in them as well, but they're good candidates for thrombectomy. What are the concerns? We are always worried about increased risk of hemorrhage. Early enough that literature that is not very, uh, very high, they won't do well because they've got poor collateral. So you've got to treat them to get some gain. Um, so, so IVTP doesn't work very well, but mechanical thrombectomy certainly works very well in these patients. And uh, they're best candidates therefore for thrombectomy if their imaging looks good. My final bit is on wake up strokes. Again, a third of your strokes, they'll come to the hospital. And for the stroke program, this is a group where you can do a lot of good for your patients. And again, imaging is very helpful for this. Well-controlled, hypertensive, it comes in with left-sided weakness, there's neglect, and NIH is, is 14. Last known well was the night before. See how good this patient scan is? There is a large penumbra, but there is no core. This patient does not have a core at all. This patient can be managed twice. So in our case, we took the patient for a thrombectomy. The original studies that showed the benefits used MR, and we don't use MR here, but their, their hypothesis was that if you have diffusion deficit, which could be small subcortical, or a large cortical, but their flare imaging is normal. That means this patient would do well with a thrombectomy. MR is somewhat difficult to get in the morning, especially in, in our hospital. If on the other hand, 
they have um, a, a, a diffusion deficit and they also have uh, some degree of fl flare changes, which are more obvious here. But here's the diffusion, here is the flare. These patients would not be candidates for uh, IVTPA. The study is called um, the study is called a wake up, and I'll show you that in a second. So this patient did extremely well. Sometimes you'll see patients like this, where they've got a small core, but still larger um, um, area of uh, penumbra. In our experience, we treat these patients also. On the other hand, we will not treat patients like this. See, large core. And although the penumbra is even larger, but this core more than 70 mils is when we try not to treat these patients. Um, I have been part, I was, the, I was in the steering committee of DS, I was in the steering committee of DDAS. All these studies, we've been trying to look at windows beyond three hours and these studies have been failing. So wake up stroke and extend are two studies that have shown that if you carefully select these patients, you can actually treat them with IVTPA. I was there when the study was presented three years ago now in Sweden, uh, and this study used MR, and you can see that if you have the criterion that I just showed you on MR, the patients who got IVTPA following a wake-up stroke, an absolute difference of 10%, better outcome, full recovery of more than 10%. More recent data shows that actually you can use CT multimodal imaging also for wake up stroke and we tend to use this much more frequently. So here's where I end my presentation with the following conclusions. First of all, for all the nurses and for all the, uh, the, the medics, uh, it is important that you see these patients early in the ER take them to the stroke prevention, uh, take them to the stroke uh, units to prevent complications. Every patient benefits from this. It requires a multidisciplinary approach. And if you have a stroke unit, um, that's great. And I know some of your hospitals have it. And if you don't have a stroke unit, you seriously consider building a stroke unit. That's my most important message. I've explained to you that uh, for IV TPA, time is extremely important. The sooner you treat your patients, the better it is. Uh, and your, your, your gain can uh, increase from, you know, an absolute difference of eight or 10% to as high as 30 or 40% if you treat them earlier. Uh, and we certainly use that quite frequently in our practice. And finally, um, and finally, uh, patients who are candidates for endovascular treatment, especially beyond the first uh, uh, six, uh, uh, beyond the first four and a half hours, require imaging. And I can tell you, there are patients we have had three, four, five, six days into a stroke. If they have a small core, less than 70 mils, and if they've got tissue to salvage, we will go ahead and treat them. So here is where I stop. I stopped a minute early. I'm hoping that there'll be good discussion um, and there'll be lots of questions and the more the controversy, and I hope people disagree with me because that's where we can have very useful discussion. I'm still impressed, you know, a thousand people. Wow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank so you Professor, for this excellent and comprehensive presentation. We should cover uh, all topic of uh, management of acute stroke. The early and rapid treatment is the best. This is the uh, most important uh, conclusion for your uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Ashreen and, uh, if she has any comment or uh, uh, if she has any comment about the lecture. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you, Professor Ashba, so much for this uh, informative lecture. Um, I need to ask you about your experience with the connected plays in acute stroke. Oh, certainly, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So uh, we have a trial ongoing right now. We call it ACT. So we are comparing... Uh, um, uh, an electroplase to TNK. We, are, we, we will be looking at 14, 
1,400 patients. We are at 780 patients. And basically what we do is we compare every patient that comes in. There are 17, 18 centers in Canada uh, looking at um, the TNK or um, uh, TPA and 90-day outcome. All the published data, and there's data from, uh, from Norway, there's data from the US, there's data from Australia, that would suggest that TNK probably at a dose of 0.25 milligrams per kilogram is better than TPA. And there are multiple reasons for that. It's a single, it's easier to administer, yes. especially when you think of uh, um, comparing patients who are going in for thrombectomy, which is probably 70 percent of our patients who get TPA or TNK these days. Because you think about it, when you start your uh, IV TPA, that is uh, infusing and it, you, you haven't had the full dose in by the time the thrombectomy is being done. On the other hand, if you give TNK, uh, it's a single bolus. So when, when the, when the uh, Australians were doing their extend trial, half the patients were given TPA and the other half got TNK. So by the time they uh, did the puncture for a thrombectomy, 11% of patients who got TPA, the vessel had opened up. And to no surprise, uh, those who got TNK, this number was 22%. So double the number of patients who got TNK actually opened up and did not require a thrombectomy. So we are, we, we are very fond of it. We, we, we use it very safely. And uh, I think probably it'll take us another year before our study is completed to have a definitive answer to your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, one more question, please. Please go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, uh, in our ER, we have uh, the facility to do MRI and MRA. Do you think it's it's better over CT and CT perfusion or the same? Uh, no, that's a, that's an excellent question. It's a very very good question. So, in in Europe, most, mostly in France and Germany, it's a German Saudi hospital. So, um, you probably follow some of their philosophy. They do MR, and, and if you can get an MR done faster. That's the key thing. If you can get it, done it as fast as a CT, then MR gives you more information. The, the problem with MR is it's also, you know, if the patient moves a little, it, it, it causes artifact. If you don't know whether they have a implant um, uh, or, or if they have a pacemaker or if they got some um, metal, that's about 15, 20% of our patients. So you can't use it there also. So in, in, in patients who come in under four and a half hours, your goal basically is to rule out a hemorrhage, rule, rule out a big stroke and give TPA. So we find in our practice, it's more convenient, but, uh, but there's a big advantage to MR. If the MR does not show a lesion, then it's probably a mimic. So you can save a lot of people getting TPA who are mimics. In, in our case, out of the 150, 160, 180 people who get TPA every year, I think we're giving 30 or, or more patients with mimics TPA. So, so you've got advantages and disadvantages. So if you can streamline it, MR gives you more information but MR also is much more difficult because of the reason that I described for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor, what about the diffusion negative uh, stroke? Some, sometimes the vicinal circulation of the stroke, the, uh, the diffusion study did not show the, uh, the lesion, in spite that the patient are clinically having uh, uh, weakness and having a sign of a stroke. Yeah, ex ex another excellent question. Uh, yeah, of course, in, in, in uh, the Middle East, especially when I was in uh, building the program for Qatar, um, we saw that very frequently. Younger people with uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes would have these small lesions in the posterior circulation. So if you do high field 3T MR you, and, and take these less than 0.5 millimeter cuts, if you're suspicious, 
with the posterior circulation stroke. You, you very infrequently miss them. But if your clinical suspicion is high, like, you know, if you, you know that this is a Wallenberg syndrome, uh, then you treat them. On the other hand, if your clinical suspicion is also not very good, you know, you think it's a stroke, maybe it's not a stroke, and you do an MR and it's normal. Uh, let me put it another way. If clinically you see a patient who cannot speak and has a hemiplasia, I have never seen a diffusion negative stroke. On the other hand, like you said, if you think it's a posterior circulation stroke, very frequently you may miss it on, on the first MR and the next day you may find it when you repeat the study. The posterior circulation can definitely be tricky. Um, and you should keep a track of those because I don't see them as many here, but certainly in the Middle East, you see a lot of posterior circulation stroke. Great question. We see about the 10 patients, Professor, uh, during last year with this uh, presentation. Yeah. And I revised some data and I saw that um, coronal diffusion weighted image will help a lot. If we did coronal diffusion weighted image, it can show us some more than the axial in this situation. With Very thin good. cuts, Ahmed, too. Yes, of course. Excellent question. Well, you know what? Uh, keep on collecting those patients. And as I was joking with Dr. Mustafa, <laughs> have me come over, I'll sit with you and we can write up a very nice paper. But 10 patients is not enough. You need probably around yes. 70, 80 or more patients. Yes. Great work. So if can I ask one question? Um, uh, about the patient who come within six hours and uh, we do CT angio uh, and we found large vessel occlusion, of course they receive TBA, but they have poor collaterals. Uh, you show us one case who uh, have uh, unfavorable outcome, large edema and uh, hemorrhage with these cases. Usually the protocol you proceed for every patient within 60 hours to have thrombectomy, if, even if they have poor collaterals, very poor collaterals? Yeah, I, I, do, I struggle with that. Uh, most of us struggle with that. And I'll tell you why. Um, so when we were... When we were doing ESCAPE, which was our trial, we excluded those patients. So the criterion for, uh, for a thrombectomy, and we were, the trial was up to 12 hours, but most patients were in the six to eight hours time window. If they had poor collaterals, we would not enroll them into the study. If you then look at dawn or diffuse, the 24 hour, time window or 18, 16 hours time window, they made it mandatory that you had to do perfusion imaging using the rapid software. So they basically said, if your core, and you can pick up the core on your simple diffusion imaging also, if your core is more than 70 mil, be very careful because your risk of hemorrhage increases and your gain is not very good. I think if you're going to be the primary thrombectomy center for all of Jeddah and hopefully beyond that, uh, you need to have a good software installed. And the patients, the easy ones are large, the larger the penumbra, the smaller the core, as I showed you examples. Those ones, you've got to go in, and, and if you've if you got five thrombectomy, uh, trained um, radiologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, that's excellent because otherwise you'll burn them out because, because it's, uh, it, it takes a lot of time, right, uh, to do these procedures. Small core, large penumbra, good access, single pass, it's a miracle treatment. It's the best treatment. The number needed to treat is one in three. But as you start getting out of these uh, um, state forward cases, as your core starts increasing, you know, the core goes to 100 mils or 150 mils, then your gain gets less and less. So if your collaterals are not good and you're at six hours, you're probably not going to do well and you'll probably get a hemorrhage. Unfortunately, that's about 15 to 20% of your patients. Um, my my um, my uh, um, 
suggestion would be to be careful because people don't forget that. The emergency department will not forget it. The hospital would say you're killing people, right? Because they, unfortunately, they, they don't remember your success. The, those patients are gone. But the patient who bleeds, oh, it's Ahmed's fault or it's Mustafa's fault, right? So, so slowly, as you get much more local experience, um, you will get more comfortable with those cases. Uh, Dr. Majid, uh, do you have yeah. any comment, please? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Uh, Sh Shuaib. Uh, I'm Dr. Majid Bakit. I'm the one of the fellow with Dr. Robert Hart. I see you many times in Canada. Thank you for so much for this uh, brilliant lecture, and we learn a lot. My question, uh, last week I have a 14 years old boy. He was uh, completely well, and during playing with his uh, br brother, he developed a phase and right-sided weakness. He came to the emergency room within half an hour, post uh, symptom. So I saw him. Uh, actually, I didn't give him IV TB. I shifted him uh, immediately to mechanical thrombectomy, which take around three hours. And uh, we didn't succeed very well because the thrombosis was very hard. And there is only just partial recolonization. When we go retrospectively, the patient, this boy has a renal artery thrombosis. My question, what is your experience with those young uh, patients uh, less than 18 years old? Yes, um, Majid, nice to talk to you. Nice. I, I knew somebody had told me that there's a lot of Canadian trains. Um, I think Mustafa told me out yes. there, there. So yes, uh, it's, you, I, you trained in a very good program. Um, I, I, we see them. So basically, it's uncommon. As you know, most pediatric stroke does not come early enough. Yes. Um, so it's too late by the time they come in. You had an yes. opportunity of getting somebody earlier. Uh, see, the problem, um, Majid, is that most of this software and the tools that have been developed, uh, the stents, they're for adults. Um, yes. they, they don't work very well with yeah. young children because young children are just not, one should not think of them as small people. They're actually different. Their, their brain yeah. responds to ischemia differently. Their mechanisms for stroke is very different. And your patient had a thrombus in the renal, renal artery also. So you've got to think of the mechanism, you know, what was the yes. mechanism here? Our, our experience is that the longer the clot, the more difficult to take it out. Yes. Um, and, and we see these clots that extend from the um, common carotid all the way into the MCA. And you can just never take those out. They're just too big. Um, we also have our experiences that if it takes you three hours, unfortunately, they're not going to do well because they've got anesthesia on board. Every time you make a pass, you're also injuring that vessel. Uh, in yeah. the endothelial surface. Uh, people don't realize this, that the... the stent as you pull it is actually doing harm also because it yeah. pulls the clot but it also damages the endothelium so if yeah. you make two or three passes the likelihood of success becomes very low having said that don't be discouraged you know unfortunately this patient did not do well but inshallah your next patients would do well i'm very impressed that your center can uh, get these patients uh, so yeah. so quickly into into the angio suite. Yes. Thank you, thank yeah. you, Prof. Regarding the long uh, thrombus, we were lucky with one patient who have long thrombus from the bifurcation of the carotid till the M1. Uh, it was about more than 10 centimeters, but she was lucky that she came within one hour of the onset. She and we can pull out the thrombus and the patient improved dramatically within uh, uh, one week within the first week and charged very well. well, I, will well you, I will send you the, the photo of the thrombus yeah. by email. But you know, that's what makes it, makes it worthwhile, isn't it? But those of us who, um, I mean, the older ones like me, you know, when I started, all we had was we would fight about the dose of uh, aspirin. Majid, you may remember that also in some of those programs we did, you know, it's 81 milligrams good or 325 or 1300 milligrams, we had nothing. But then in the last 10 years, especially in the last five years, the stroke, uh, everything has changed. Imaging is so important. Uh, 
the access is so important, enthusiasm is so important. Um, and programs like this, you know, you get a thousand people. I'm very impressed. I don't know how you did it. I want to see the list of these people. Is it really a thousand people or are you just making me happy? That's a, that's a big group, mashallah. Uh, thank you, Professor. We have many questions for the audience. We have uh, many, uh, you have many audience. Uh, uh, we have a mini question. Can we can start rapid dance time for the question? All right. So I can see some of them. Uh, there's okay. one from Yusuf Raji Khan, who yeah. says, what's the yeah. TIA? Uh, my answer would be a TIA basically is a small stroke. That's how we see it. TIA is a person who, whose symptoms recover within 24 hours. And if you do sophisticated imaging, like an MR, in 40 or 50% of them, they actually have a small stroke. So it gives you a warning to prevent the big stroke. If you remember my first slide, I'd shown you that once you're assessing these patients, you've got to find a mechanism, and then you've got to give them a treatment to prevent their next stroke. I did not focus on that because maybe it's a talk, topic for another discussion, but a TIA is at a very high risk of bigger stroke. And uh, sometimes uh, they may be from a blocked artery in the neck, sometimes they may be cardiomolic, et cetera, but a, a milder stroke is a TIA. Uh, you also ask questions about signs and symptoms. Stroke is sudden. That's what it means. It means like you've been struck with lightning. That's where the word comes from. So anytime you have a sudden onset of speech difficulty or weakness on one side of the body or very severe headache or acute vertigo, dizziness, those would be a signs and symptoms of a, of, 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 a, of a stroke. Then there is how much neuroplasticity works in recovery. You know, it's very surprising. It could be very, very good. Most patients with stroke get, um, get better. And the sooner you start with your uh, rehab treatment, which is physio, excuse me, physiotherapy, and watch out for depression. One of the paper that uh, came out of the German uh, uh, Saudi hospital in Medina, excellent paper. Uh, by Fawad was to look at um, the effect of COVID in, on depression. And he, and he cured nicely that because you couldn't get enough family members there, they were getting more depressed and depression slows down plasticity and recovery after a stroke. Another question is, can you fully recover from the stroke? Yes, I just showed you the data. Remember that slide I was showing you that 25% of people recover if you don't give them any treatment and if you give them TPA within the first hour, 68% of them make a full recovery. So treatment is very, very effective in these patients, but they have to come to hospital fast enough. And the uh, Azar Radi says, if the patient received IV TPA, the MCA stent was placed after thrombectomy. Do we give double, that's an excellent question. So uh, most of the times we pull the stent out. So the question is, uh, when you put a stent, do you give dual antiplatelets or not? So in the vast majority of patients, the stent goes out there. It's not like the cardiac stent. So you put a stent, you trap the, the, the clot and you pull it out. But if you have intracranial stenosis, which is common in people from uh, Southeast uh, Asia, so India or the Far East, uh, we, we would frequently leave uh, a stent and it's a, different, it's a different kind of a stent. If we do that, in fact, before we put the stent in, we give them rectal, we give them rectal um, uh, aspirin, usually 650 milligrams. And we also, through an NG tube, give them Plavix because you don't want thrombosis in that stent. It's, it's a very complicated, difficult discussion, and I don't want to take too much of your time. So I'm going to leave it at that, that yes, you would give them uh, Plavix and, and antiplatelet, other an aspirin. Um, then the next one is Sultan Ahmed. Who has the privilege to decide if stroke patient is candidate for TPA or not? I've just given given you the criterion. If they come in under um, four and a half hours and their CT scan looks good and their symptoms are likely from a stroke, most of the time your your um, 
neurologist will treat them, but you have to be in a hospital where they can do this. This is a dangerous drug. You can't just go to any hospital and expect the treatment. You need to be in a hospital like uh, the Saudi uh, German hospital in, in, in Jeddah, where you were trained people who can do this work. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, it, it is a very effective treatment. On the other hand, I showed you the data that it can cause a bleed. So an inappropriately selected patient, it may cause a hemorrhage. So El Akhtar asks, in case of severe MCA infarct, high NIHS match deficit, um, no, I think in patients who got match deficits, um, uh, the, the benefit may not be very good. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you, Mustafa, how, how long? Do you want me to go through all these quest questions here or do you want me to stop? It's, it's your choice. Uh, I, I have the time, but it's up to you. Uh, we, can, we can take few, uh, two, uh, a, few, a few questions, uh, then we can... Uh... Sure, just let me know when okay. what you want me to stop. Okay. Basic okay. management of stroke, this is what okay. Mohammed Kaleem is asking. Excellent, mm -hmm. very important question. That's where the stroke unit becomes very important, right? The patients are extremely mm -hmm. unstable. In the first hour to several hours, they can develop aspiration pneumonia, they can have venous thrombosis, they can get bladder infections. So these patients need to be in a stroke unit. Uh, if you want to take a message home, make sure that your hospital or your dear ones, if they ever have a stroke, that they be taken care of in a stroke unit. That's the basic management, prevent complications. If the patient is a candidate for thrombectomy and is being considered non-urgent, there is no such thing as non-urgent thrombectomy. They're always urgent. So if they go to a hospital, that is not do thrombectomy. So let us say you go to Mecca and they do the imaging. They would have a very good phone connection with the Saudi German hospital. So what, what will happen is their consultant would call this hospital. They would discuss, is there an, is there an occlusion or not? Then they would look at the perfusion imaging. If the perfusion imaging shows a mismatch, large penumbra, small core, those patients should be transferred. And yes, if they are within the first four and a half hours, they should get TPA. Uh, we do that all the time. So give them TPA because that clot may open up. In one in 10 patients, you may not require a, a thrombectomy. Right? So it's a very good question. Um, then I can't see what Elham is asking. Is there a question there or? There's no question there, I think. Um, then there are some questions about audio and voice. I think I'm going to leave those. And then Mohammed uh, Elham. Dr. Ma Dr. Majid or Dr. Uh, Shireen uh, or Dr. Ahmed, anybody have a question? Thank you so much, doctor. Thanks so much. All right then. I enjoyed my, my communication. The questions and answers section was excellent. And thank you for arranging this. I still want proof that more than a thousand people were listening in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your, uh, for your uh, excellent lecture. And thank you for uh, our, atten uh, our attendees. Thank you, Dr. Ashreen, Dr. Majid, and Dr. Ahmed, and thank you for our organizing uh, committee for this uh, uh, successful uh, webinar. And I hope to see you physically, inshallah, in Jeddah. I would look forward to that, and, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. See you, Master Alex. Bye, Master. Master.